I'm going to choose to do this in both uh, discussing it kind of conversationally uh, with myself and doing a little script reading because, you know, I feel any speech pathologist is going to constantly need to look inside of their books and stay vigilant in the fact of this is an ongoing process to help work with people in order to make sure that their life and the world around them is easily accessible through the way that they communicate. Um, I want to start out with the second question being that, you know, it both, they play in together. Um, if I'm going to choose to work at, in an elementary school or if I'm going to work in a pediatric private practice, you know, there's going to be the same <clears throat> type of <clears throat> people that I'd be working with. Uh, they're both children, uh, some of them being younger than the other aspect of whether I'm a school-based speech pathologist or I'm working with pediatric clients. Um, you know, they're both children who I'm going to be serving in both of these settings. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my primary purpose of the services that I'm providing is basically what I've kind of come down to is in I'm giving prevention. I'm going to be giving general health maintenance in environmental hazards, uh, exploring all the prenatal factors and, you know, giving early identification and intervention to any child that could be coming to, uh, you know, have a, a development of a communication disorder, a delay, a difference in any of the factors being whether it's, you know, uh, a speech problem or a fluency problem or there's some kind of linguistic diversity. Uh, they have an articulation disorder or phonology or anything like that. You know, it's my primary thing would be to, you know, give the elimination or inhibition of the onset of a development of a communication disorder by altering the susceptibility. Um, as far as it goes with all of these public policies, there are so many and I wish I could cover it all in 10 minutes. You know, some of the ones that are uh, pretty prominent, I would like to say, would be, you know, the No Child Left Behind Act, and especially the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Improvement Act of 2004. You know, um, when it comes to how my service or services are going to be dictated in either one of these settings, they both really play uh, together in the fact that if I'm going to be doing an intervention and, you know, evaluating uh, a child that's in, you know, uh, a pediatric private practice, I still need to be able to identify that there is a referral there for them to receive services. You know, I'm going to have to give assessment plans and go about the way I'm going to do my assessment methods by getting family history from the parents or getting the student's history from their teachers and, you know, being able to collect data by giving non-standardized and standardized assessments. Uh, through all of doing that, giving all of this assessment, you know, my evaluations are going to be uh, finding their strengths and their weaknesses, what their needs would be, and, you know, what, what emerging abilities are there too. 
you know, I'm going to interpret all of this information to see whether or not there are, you know, there's a relevance to where they're having academic uh, problems or social emotional problems, vocational factors, uh, kind of right there, you know, I'm mostly speaking of the one setting of working as a school-based speech pathologist, but also, you know, it, it kind of ties into the development of, you know, how uh, a child would grow from ages, you know, zero to five years old, you know, those are kind of big things, you know, where, you know, we need to see what their attention's like, how their cognitive factors are, uh, whether or not this you know, a uh, young child has hearing loss or deafness, you know, um, some of these uh, things kind of fall into the whole that I spoke about earlier with, you know, the, um, the public policies, you know, uh, there's federal mandates out there state regulations and guidelines that we all need to follow in the procedures of finding the presence of a disorder or a delay and moving about the best way in order to give the services to eliminate um, any potential communication disorder and altering the susceptibility that you know, these young children may come across. Oh, let's see. Well, I find that in both of these settings, you know, there are it's a huge team of people, you know, not only am I as the speech pathologist, one of these members like other professionals would be linguists or psychologists or audiologists, uh, neuropsychotherapists. I mean, even the teachers, the ones who are providing the education to the ones that are in the school based, uh, you know, practice that I would be giving. Um, let's see. Like one of my main roles, I think would be um, I'm going to be the one who's going to sit there and give all of these assessments and uh, testings um, to find out, you know, whether or not this child is going to be eligible, you know, for receiving services, whether they're in the school, or they're, you know, uh, in preschool or birth to three, you know, there's lots of transition levels that happen. Um, and In providing intervention for either one of these settings, you know, it's my job to actually take all of my findings and interpret them into a relevant way so that I'm going to be able to show that this person is in fact having their life hindered due to these types of, you know, disorders, delays, or differences that you know, are something that's going to be popping up for them. I mean, there are many roles that uh, a speech pathologist can play and being the one who's providing, you know, the, the articulation uh, therapy or the phonology therapy phonemic awareness, all, all of that stuff. Um, 
you know, my role isn't just one thing and one thing only. There is so much. And I don't know if I've mentioned it yet, but I don't think 10 minutes can really, you know, go about a time frame for me to explain a lot of this. And even doing this like conversationally by myself in my room, it's kind of hard because I like to bounce and play off of other people who are within the same realm of being like-minded in that we are trying to make sure that we can do everything in our due diligence to provide the services to anybody of any age or you know, uh, ethnical background, um, to make sure that they have the best fighting chance to, you know, create the best life for themselves without being hindered by a communication disorder. And, you know, a thing that Miss Walden has taught me is being able to counsel, even though we're not counselors or therapists, we still need to be able to maintain that professional level in giving somebody bad news in a good way and being able to step back from our personal feelings to show them that, hey, you know what? This is something that's happening and it's okay. We're going to deal with it and we're going to hit this thing head on with a steel pipe or a train or you know a rocket ship we're, we're that that's our job to make sure that we're doing what we can for these pediatrics or you know uh first and secondary school children uh what kind of licensure and kind of certificate do I need? Well, I know that I'm going to need my master's degree in speech language communication disorders, and I'm also going to need my triple C's, the certificate of clinical competence. Um, you know, um, what I've learned over this crazy semester that I'm having for my last semester in my undergrad was that you know, uh, we always uh, are going to be upheld to make sure that we are staying within our clinical competence in maintaining this educational cycle. Like I said earlier, you know, sp speeches are never done learning. We always need to make sure that we are continually finding new ways to improve the way that we're providing services in all of these aspects, whether it's I'm working with someone in a hospital that has a swallowing disorder because they just had a stroke or a child that was born to a mother who used drugs and is now going to suffer and have delays in the way that they learn English or Spanish or whatever it may be. Um, I'll have to go through ASHA. Uh, that's like the number one. And Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it's just ASHA that I get my clinical competence certificate from. Uh, same with my licensures. And if I'm not maintaining the right amount of staying up with, you know, my educational standards, and if I'm not doing the right thing of, you know, uh, renewing my licenses, you know, I, I could be putting myself into such a hard situation to where I'm going to get my license revoked for me where I can't practice. And yeah, it's just going to be a, a huge hassle if I don't maintain those things that I need to do. Um, 
I'm already at 15 minutes now, and, you know, I hope I really nailed it because, uh, yeah, I've been super bummed out about how this is, this semester has turned out, where our life is at at the moment, very unprecedented times.